Have you ever wondered what it was like to be wrongly convicted of a crime and then sentenced to death by electric shock? Today we're going to find out exactly what that feels like with the second episode of the Ride the Lightning series. Today we're doing Ride the Lightning. Let's take a look at that introductory guitar harmony where it really does paint a picture of you getting shocked by 60,000 gigavolts. So what we're doing on the top half is going open E up to the 12th and the 13th fret of the B. Now this is Kirk's part. This is the high guitar harmony. Um, we're going from the 5th of the chord, so we're in E minor, the 5th of the chord to the flat 6th. And then we're coming down to the 14th fret of the G, up to the 12th of the B. So we're dealing with groupings of two. That is a resolution from the 4th to the 5th scale degree. So back to the first one we started on. And then we go 1 to 2, or 1 to 9, whichever way you want to slice it. And then we're hitting flat third to root. Now in the studio recording, I'm pretty sure these E palm mutes in between are overdubbed to make them nice and tight, but if you're going to play this live, you're going to have to do that in between the moving notes. Now James's part goes like this, still hitting with the low E string, right? That's the two to the flat three, flat seven to the one, four to the five, which is uh, down an octave from what was happening earlier, and then and then the flat seven to the root down the octave again. So pretty simple, but it sounds really cool when you put it together. So let me tell you a little something else about this introduction. At the very end, believe it or not, there is a measure of 5-4 that is created by the guitar. And it's, it happens in between the intro and the transition of the verse. So we're going through our part. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And into the next section. You see that measure of five? Now here's the interesting part. The guitar is the only thing that shifts the timing. The drums and bass stay exactly in the same spot. So they don't change anything. The only difference is because of what the guitar does, the drums land instead of on the first beat and the third beat in the original part, they now land on the second and fourth beat, so beats two and four. So the drums start off on beats one and three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But because of the measure of five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, it offsets it to beats two and four, completely changing the groove and the feel. Now I like to think of this intro riff, verse, and pre-chorus sort of thing as being a, a prototypical version of Master of Puppets. So Master of Puppets before Master of Puppets ever happened. The reason why is because in Master of Puppets we have this in E minor. Right? And we're outlining the blues progression. Now here we're just doing an incomplete version of it, where we're sliding from the A to the B flat. Right? On beats 1, 2, and 3, 4. So the beat 1 and the and of 2. And we're basically just outlining the blue note. We're sliding into the flat 5, which is a tritone away, which then immediately goes into this, F sharp. Where does Master of Puppets go? To F sharp, just like in this song. Uh, but this is a little bit different, so we go. So for the second setup riff, we have F sharp to E, okay, so one to flat seven. We change keys here. Um, then going to the third, and then back down to the root and up a flatted fifth. Now when I first heard this, I thought it was going like this, to A, B, C, but it's not doing that, it's going like So on that last downbeat F sharp, where we hit the cold stop, begins a faster, accelerated version of a 7-8 measure. So. Three, four, five, six, seven, seven. And of course, it's slightly faster to, to give it actually a more human feel. Lars definitely does not wait 
<laughs> a normal measure of 7-8 in the previous tempo. That just doesn't happen. Which tells me that they didn't record this to a click track, or at least not the whole thing. Maybe certain sections, but there are a lot of places here where things just speed up dramatically and then come back down to the original tempo like that. So the verse riff is very similar to the first part of that introductory setup where we have the uh, this bluesy thing or the incomplete master of puppets but on the last time around you go like this which is a C and a B and then we come back in okay, keep on rolling which then we go right into F sharp so that's why I'm saying it's like master of puppets here because it still goes up the same whole step into F sharp um, now that C and that B that's just the flat six and the five coming into the new key center, which is the F sharp, which is a, it's a hammer on from the second fret to the fourth fret of the A string. I'd use my pointer to the pinky while holding the second fret of the low E as your pedal point F sharp. So you got. So really not too much to say about that. Let's get to the chorus. The chorus section, I believe, is a fine example of James Hetfield solidifying himself as not just a metal rhythm guitar mastermind, but also a songwriting mastermind as well. You can tell he listened to a lot of the Beatles. So let's take a look at the guitar part first, and then I'll go over what the vocals are doing on top to give you an idea of the creativity behind it. So we start off on C sharp as our new key center. All right, C sharp, C B, C sharp, A. And then this quick little hiccup beat. You gotta hit a palm mute on the downbeat and a B, just a single note. And then it goes back into this. So we ride back on F sharp as another one, okay? So I would say that this is a dual key center type of situation. We have the C sharp minor going chromatically down to its flat 7B, coming back up to C sharp, but then we hit this A, which is just, it's a flat 6. It's definitely a flat 6. It's like Phantom of the Opera, which notoriously hits that flat 6 note. So that's exactly what we're doing. Now the vocals are hitting, are going right along with the root notes. C sharp, C, B, C, but then when it hits the A chord, it stays on the C sharp. So it's going. So it remains static while the chord changes underneath. And then the very last time, it goes up a major third. So you're actually harmonizing and going right down. That's almost a C-sharp major idea, because we have the, uh, the F, or actually the E-sharp. An E-sharp on top of a C-sharp is a true major third, and F would be a diminished fourth. Don't forget that. We've already changed keys uh, three times within the song already, and the Beatles, in case you didn't know, used to do that all the time as well. And they would always do it in such a slick way where you wouldn't even realize you're moving anywhere else. Metallica is the same way. James Hetfield is the same way. That's why I call him the Paul McCartney of metal. So after we rinse and repeat the verse, pre-chorus, and chorus sections once again, we head into this bridge riff. So this one kind of confused me. Uh, originally I thought it was like this. So you're going chromatically from D, D sharp to D, and then hitting an A to C, and then E, F sharp, G, just all power chords. But I later found out that that is not the case. I watched them play it live a couple of times, and it looks like they're moving down chromatically. Sort of that uh, Phantom of the Opera vibe again, but this time it's, it's really sneaky the way that they kind of do this. So I'll show you what it is slow. So you go from E, which is our new key center, number one, E, D sharp to D. So you're going chromatically down to the flat seven, just like in the chorus, by the way. So this isn't too far removed from what we just played. 
Um, now instead of doing a palm mute on say an E or an A, we're actually just shifting the chord down, focusing our attention on a C sharp on the low two strings for that real chunky type of power chord. So, right? And then we hit the C, right? To a regular C power chord and without the low E string on the bottom. And basically what we do after that is another mute into a super heavy B power chord with the low E string, focus on the low E and A. So you get that really chunky perfect fourth down at the bottom. And then we hit a G, which then focuses on the low G. So it kind of sounds like it's going from F sharp to G. And that's what you want to accentuate when you're playing this riff. You just ride on the E, about all those sixteenth notes in there, going to a G, which is a flat third. The bridge continues on with the "Someone Help Me" section, so I'm going to help you with this. We're going to go on to C, which is the flat six chord, with this. Now this is all sixteenth notes, right? Going to B, B flat, A, F, G, B flat, right back into the other riff. Now let's take a look theoretically what's happening. We got a flat six to five, and then we have this. We just changed keys. So we basically went into D minor, and we're also playing a flat six here as well. So this is a B flat, which is a flat six of D minor. Now we don't have to play a D to know that we're in a type of D scale. Um, it's because we were just in E minor, and we just played the flat six on C, right? And to the five, so why not do it again? Flat six, five. Okay, and then we hit the three chord, which would be F, then four, flat six, and then we transition back to the original E, which is a tritone away. So kind of disjointed, but it works because the earlier sections were in a blues, and of course we know the blues has the tritone in that place there. We continue on to play the first part of the bridge a few times, but then the last time we go like this. We just hang on the C, which is the flat six, then we go to the five chord. A little, a little drum fill, pre-solo riff, which then becomes the solo. Alright, so we got E, one, to G to C, to F sharp, to G to A. Now you want to play the G to A like this, where you just pick it once and slide up to the A, and then hit the A again. So now it's time to take down the notorious Ride the Lightning solo. Now it's a very long solo, there's a lot of different sections, a lot of different parts, and a lot of different techniques and colors that we need to implement as we're playing this. So I'm going to split this up into a few different sections and we're going to get on with each one as it happens. So here's the first section. So we're in E minor, so everything is following that key, and we're starting off with a tapping sequence, which actually outlines a C major arpeggio that plays on top of all the different chords. Right? So if we're looking at the rhythm guitar, this C major is happening over the E, it's like a C over an E, over a C chord, so that makes perfect sense, and then once it hits the A, it actually turns it into an A minor quality. A C major chord on top of an A minor creates an A minor 7th chord. So let's take a look at how we play that technically. You're going to take your pointer finger at the 12th fret of the G and start by just tapping that note. And then you're going to go down to your pointer 
which will hit the root note C at the 5th fret, and then your pinky is going to hit the ninth fret, which is an E. Okay, so you have 5, root, 3, just like that. And you just do that in a triplet rhythm, or actually a sextuplet rhythm. You do that through the entire course of the riff, and then once it ends, you tap the 14th fret, which is an A. Okay, so that is the, uh, that's the fourth, the perfect fourth on top of the E minor. We continue on with a bend going up like this, and resolve into an F sharp. Okay, so we're starting up, bending into the B of the E minor, into an F sharp. Now in the key of E minor, the F sharp is the ninth. But the C is the chord that is operating underneath that. So the F sharp actually becomes a sharp 11. Very interesting. So after we finish that, we go. So that's just playing around with more notes in the E minor scale. Uh, nine, flat third, and then a hammer on pull off to the 14th of the D, and then slide up to that 14th fret from the 12th. We continue on with one of these into an octave section. Right, just follow the pattern exactly how it should be. We're just going all the way up the E minor scale in octaves, starting at the 7th fret of the A string, going up, just scaling up to the top all the E natural minor scale. So E, F sharp, G, to A, one, two, three, four. And then we just change the rhythm from there. And then we bust straight into what looks like an E minor blues lick. Right, just going flat three, four, to the five with a bend. But then we immediately head up to this position which is actually in a B minor pentatonic position. So we're going all the way up to the 19th fret, and we're going, bending at the 21st, and we're playing around as if we're in the key of B minor, but we're not. We're still in the key of E minor. Uh, and because of this, we're hitting the 9th to the root, flat 7 to 5 back to flat 7, but it works perfectly because it's very pentatonically based. And then we have, just another B minor pentatonic riff. I'll play that slow for you real quick. So we go up, bend at the 21st, go 19th, bend at the 22nd, and that does it for the first section. Now we just begun. Already we have a tapping section, we have some little licks in between that, uh, you know, hammer-ons and pull-offs and blah blah blah. We have some tricky blues runs, which aren't actually in the blues scales. Um, a lot of colorful stuff going on already. We didn't even get out of the first section yet. So before tackling the actual lead, let's go over the rhythm guitar part first. F sharp minor to D, right, into an A to B. So everything just moves up a whole step. Nothing really to say about that, you're just adding more chugs in between. Now let's talk about what's going on with the lead guitar. Now we're in the key of F sharp minor and there's a lot of true F sharp minor pentatonic runs going on here. So it's no question that that's the key we're in. But this is probably one of the more difficult sections of the entire solo because there's a lot of non-stop runs going all the way down and up and back down and then they're just continuous. They don't stop. Kirk does not take a break during this part. <laughs> So let's stop it there. So we start off over on the 14th fret for F sharp. 
And then we're coming up to the minor third, the 17th fret, and doing this long series of pentatonic pull-offs. Okay, pentatonic pull-offs, PPs. So let's stop it there. We have pull-off, pull-off, and we go down to the G. Pull-off, pull-off, pull-off. All right, so you got to go down the stairs twice, up the stairs twice, down the stairs again. And then we go up one. Right? We have to keep going down here with a slide with the ring finger. Coming down again, we're still just in F sharp minor pentatonic, so just pay attention to the tab if you're getting a little lost here. And then we go. So that's just a little slide going in from four to five, flat seven, and then resolving to root minor third. And then eventually you play that lick coming back into the minor third. Okay, and then we draw into this. That's just a straight up blues lick, man. That's like something you'd hear in an ACDC song. Then we go. So that's just pull, 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 pull. With those little uh, bluesy bends in there. And you're just outlining the, uh, the 16th fret, 14th fret into the 16th to the D. So, perfect fifth bend, flat third, root. It's just a minor arpeggio. And then we head into here. Okay, so that's just another pull off -y pentatonic riff, but you're heading into the 19th fret. So you're just extending it up a whole step. So you're going minor third, root, flat seven. Back up, flat third, fourth, flat third. Okay, so nothing too crazy there. Now if you listen to uh, the isolated tracks, it sounds like there's like a, a triplet delay effect on it, so it makes the it makes the part sound a little bit different than what I just played, but this, this is what's being played there. It's just the delay trail makes it sound a little fancier than what it actually is, and actually it beefens it up as well too. We come out of that with a triplet run, go down three, Come up one, come down two, up one, down two, up one, down two. That's all it is. And then you do it again. And then end with that little eighth note thing. And then we have this. So that's kind of interesting when you look at the notes that are being played. For the first time in this entire section, we're actually touching the flat six scale degree on that on that pull-off. It's almost as if we're playing in the key of B minor, right? Because we have the D, the C sharp, and the B. That's like a flat three, two to one in B minor. But really, it's flat six, resolving down to the four. Then we come back up, just up the F sharp minor scale. But here, we hit the root, all as well. But this note right here, G. Okay, well that's a little interesting there. The G is not in the key of F sharp minor. It's actually the flat two. Um, so I think this is just an accident. This is a happy little accident. So we come up with the same scale pattern, but this time we're, we're starting as if we're like a, in an F sharp Phrygian, because we have the flat two, and we come up, but really we're just playing the E minor scale shape. So that's the whole mystery there. Kirk didn't really have an accident. He just played the wrong scale on top of the wrong key. But that's okay. It sounds good. And we top off this section with, uh, uh, rhythmically, we have this going on at the bottom. Three A's, two G's, and then an F. Now, here's how they handle this. On the lead, we're coming up, we're actually starting on the note C sharp. So that implies that this is some kind of A major. Sixteenth notes coming down, but kind of sloppy. You know, Kirk Hammett style. Then we come back up to the uh, the root note A, and then very quickly we have to depress the bar and hammer onto the fifth fret of the G string, and then bring the bar up so you can get that that sort of rip that rip chord sort of thing going up there. Then we harmonize it. up 
to the San Jose River. Just like the last section, before we hit the lead, we gotta hit the rhythm. You gotta understand the rhythm before you can play the lead. So all it's doing is we're riding on that E in a thrashy 16th note, pulling off the third fret. Right? That's B C B, five flat six five. So we're definitely in the key of E minor here. Now the cool thing is, is that this clashes with the lead on the top at one point because we're hitting B, C, B with a flat six on the bottom, but in the solo, Kirk goes like this, which is a Dorian thing. That's a C sharp on the top, played against the C. Wow. All right, so we hop out of that San Jose River guitar harmony craziness, and we hop into something a little more generic. All right, we need a break sometimes from all the fancy stuff. We can't play fancy stuff all the time. Sometimes we have to go back to straight up blues, and that's exactly what we're doing here. So that lick right there is pretty self-explanatory. Just starting off with a unison bend at the 15th fret of the B and the 12th fret of the E, so you're creating that sound of the E's rubbing together, and then you come up with this. So you're you're pulling off from the flat third to the nine. And then you're doing the same exact pattern on the B string, which then becomes the flat 7 and the natural 6. So this is a Dorian type of thing. And then we pull off from here to here. Stop at the 14th fret of the G, and then we hit our little, uh, our little train beep. Right, doesn't that sound like a freaking train? Do that three times, and then we come into this. Now this is fancy. Okay, we, we took a short break from being fancy. Now we're going to come back and do some crazy shit. So we got this. E major in triplets. Until we get to that D natural. That's not an E major. Okay? That actually makes it a, a mixolydian scale. So it starts off as E major because you hit the D sharp down here. If it were mixolydian, it would sound like this. That's not what's going on. It's this. Okay? We keep going up. Fifth. Flat seven. Bending all the way up to the root, that high E way up top. Now the harmony, all that's happening is it's playing the same exact thing down a fourth. So you just count one, two, three, four, five different notes, or five half steps, which creates a perfect fourth coming down. And we just play the same exact pattern. So you start 11, 9, 7, you go up, it's the same exact pattern, just follow it up in triplets, and give it that nice whole step bend on the bottom there. Let's take a look at the rhythm first before we get into the real exciting stuff. Although the rhythm is very exciting as well because it uh, it outlines some of those chords we were using before. We start on the C, which is the flat six to five, which is the flat six to five in D minor, but then we repeat it. So there's a little variation here. That's awesome. And then we go to the F, G, B flat, back to the C. And we do this again. So that's kind of cool. It's a cool way of reusing the part. And then we're back into E minor after that. So what's so awesome about that? Well, this just shows James Hetfield's rhythmic prowess. He's saying, hey, how do I make this part more interesting, right? Well, first of all, Kirk is playing the, uh, the fast arpeggios, which, of course, is a point of interest in itself. But James has to support that. So he's thinking, well, maybe we should bring back these chords, but just elongated. Instead of just playing it one time like before, we're going to do it twice, right? And then we're going to 
come into here. Right? Just go up here. And then we repeat it once more. So keeping the song interesting is the name of the game, and that's exactly what James Hetfield does. Once again, I will reiterate, he is the Paul McCartney of metal. So now we hit into probably everybody's favorite portion of the program, the fast arpeggio section, right? This is something every guitarist, especially a metal guitarist, should have in their arsenal, is uh, some fast arpeggio. Right? Because you can just play the same thing over and over again, and it sounds cool every single time. So it starts off as if we're in an A minor, just on the 10th fret of the B string, coming up to the 8th of the E, and then 12th of the E. And you want to go down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, 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 up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up. It's like a, go it's like a, uh, a goblin. It's not like a goblin. It's like a gallop, like a horse gallops. A horse doesn't goblin. A horse gallops. So we want to do that gallop. Down, 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 up, down, 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 down. And the thing is, you can play that at blistering fast speeds once you practice it enough. Okay, so we're on A minor, but the chord underneath is C. Now how does this work? Well, the C just acts as an inverted root note. So yeah, in an A minor chord, you have a C as the minor third. So we're just using this power chord to make it an inversion, basically. So the next arpeggio is at the 8th fret of the B string, right? is rooted on it anyway and then we're hitting what is a G major arpeggio okay so and we do the same exact gallop rhythm right here down 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 now what's interesting is we're playing a B power chord which has a B and an F sharp okay now the only note that exists in a G chord um, out of those two is a B so we could think of this as a first inversion G major triad which would actually take the Roman numeral 5 and make it into a three chord in first inversion. So that's kind of interesting. And we continue to do the same thing down the line. It's a G minor on top of a B flat, which is the exact same relationship as the A minor to the C. Okay? That's like you have the flat third on the bottom. And then here we finally break and go into a regular old A major arpeggio. So that is the five chord, definitively. C sharp, A, E. And you want to roll that bar on the fifth fret. So let's talk about the harmony that's happening on the top of this section. Now I'm pretty sure he used a, uh, a harmonizer pedal to create these sounds because everything stays pretty much exactly the same. And uh, this particular section is set up a perfect fifth above. So that means we go all the way up to the 17th fret and we play all the same patterns. Except the last one. You actually play parallel minor chords going there. So you wind up on a C sharp minor chord, which would actually turn the harmony into an A major seventh at that point. So by adding these notes here, we're actually creating a C major seven chord or an A minor nine chord, right? Over C. A D on top of a G or a G major nine. And then the same deal coming down here. G minor 9 over B flat. And then A major 7. So that's A minor 9 over C. To a G major 9 over B. To a G minor 9 over B flat. To an A major 7. Wow. Just, just throwing a harmonizer pedal on there just makes everything crazy. Returning back to the melody. We have now a... F major triad, right? Now we're doing a first inversion one, so we're starting at the, uh, it's basically the 13th fret of the high E string, but the lowest note is an A, which is the 10th fret. So we're going parallel up to G, up to B flat, so following the chords exactly as they are underneath. And then we're doing this, a very interesting way of playing around with the C, B, B flat, A progression. So we have the C, C major 7 with the B, B flat for the C7, and a C6 to handle the A. So all those power chords are just now being used as the top melody note. So that's kind of cool. Then we continue on and just play this slight variation back down to that F chord in first inversion. Then a G, B flat, and then we 
uh, end with a unison bend on E, with a tritone resolution coming back into this. And real quick, the harmony underneath this whole section is down a fourth, all right? So if you don't go up a fifth, go down a fourth, and that'll give you the same type of harmony. So really, you're playing a C arpeggio here, underneath the F, and then a D arpeggio underneath the G, and then to an F, and then we do the same thing that we did on the C arpeggio, but down at a G position. So G, G major 7, G7, G6, and then back down to C, D, F, and then no bend at the end there. We can just leave that alone. Thank goodness. Now that is just a great solo. So coming out of that, we hit back into this uh, Phantom of the Opera style riff. And then we come through here again, right? Go through that whole section, right? But on the last time when we do this, we do something similar as, as the last one, but here we just hang on the C, so we don't progress any further. Cliff comes in with the bass hitting on E, so it's actually a C over an E chord, so a flat six chord in first inversion. Uh, and Lars comes in with the toms, adding that low frequency buzz down at the bottom. And then we're back into the, uh, the verse riff once again, which nothing really changes there. Goes to the pre-chorus, comes back into the chorus, nothing to see there. Uh, but then we hit it, hit up at the end, and we come back into this. Two, three, four. Very similar to the way we did it before, except we have different stopping points. We go up to the C. Then it down to the C B. And C C C C B. Back into the intro. So, thank everybody so much for coming on this journey with me through Ride the Lightning. Hope it was enlightening. Enlightening. Wow, you see that? Uh, please subscribe to the channel, give a like to the video, and uh, just leave some comments down below. That helps me uh, battle YouTube. It's a constant struggle between myself and YouTube, so help me out there. If you want to further support the channel, go to www.subscribestar.com slash Romanova Music and you can donate monthly uh, if you like the content. If you want to see me keep making it, well, it's going to have to happen. Thank you everybody and I'll see you on the third episode which is going to be, what's that song again? What's that song again? You're going to find out next time. <laughs>